I didn't have to be um, a venture capitalist working in Knightsbridge. I could be uh, a rock and roll performer living in the United States. And really, that was all I'd ever wanted to do in my life. My name is Keith Wellings and my job is I'm a civil servant working for the government department that administers support payments to farmers under the European Union's Common Agricultural Policy. I first went to America in 1988 on a business trip. Um, I was working for a venture capital company and I was invited to go and look at some properties in California with a, an investment opportunity um, for four days. And basically, I didn't come back for, for seven years. I just saw enough of what I wanted to do for the rest of my life in Southern California on that four-day trip, uh, not to come back until I more or less had to. And what happened was I was on a, a trip with a business partner of mine who suggested we went to the Hilton Hotel, the nearest one to where we were staying for this four-day trip. Um, we were having drinks at the bar and just met a group of people. And it turned out that a girl I was talking to was the daughter of America's best-known disc jockey, a guy called Wolfman Jack. And I was chatting to him and we, we got on like a house on fire. And uh, he basically said, I've got a problem. I've got to get three cars from Beverly Hills over to North Carolina. Would you be interested in road managing the trip for me? And it was just the most exciting proposition I'd ever had. So I said to my partner, I won't be going back to England after the four days. I've just got this once in a lifetime offer. And he said, um, absolutely, go for it. So the next night um, I was at my hotel and um, I got a phone call from Wolfman Jack's party basically saying that there's um, a stretch limousine downstairs waiting for you to take you to the Hollywood Bowl. Went down to the lobby, there was a stretch limousine with sunroofs, moonroofs, bar in the back and the young lady I'd met the night before. And she said, come on, let's go and talk to B.B. King. And she said to me, oh, by the way, my dad said when you meet B.B. King, because you're a guitar player, uh, make sure you give him a guitar pick because B.B. always likes to exchange guitar picks with people. And luckily I had a guitar pick in my pocket, as I always do actually, as a guitar pick here. So I met B.B. King, we're shaking hands, he's asking about guitars, England, you know, Gibson guitars, all this sort of thing, and uh, you know, we exchange pics and you know, I've got an autograph. Pre the age of the selfie actually, so no photographs, but you know, all um, things written down. And um, watched the show, absolutely fantastic, and then the next day, headed out to uh, North Carolina on this road trip of a lifetime. And I'd had my instruction, of course, which was to go and get Wolf to make sure we were on the road, you know, by the appointed time. So I just went up to him and said, uh, Wolf, we've got to go, the car's waiting outside. And he said, to, oh, everybody, this is, um, this is gonna be my son-in-law, this guy Keith from England, you've got to meet him. You know, and shook hands with everybody, Johnny Cash, Johnny Parton, Chris Christopherson, etc. cetera. Um, and then got back on the road. And when we got to North Carolina, because I'd actually, I did have a guitar with me, a travel guitar, and I'd been playing in the back of the car while somebody else was driving, and Wolf and I were you know, sort of playing and singing these songs and things. He had a fantastic studio. And he said, can you, um, you know, spend a couple of weeks with me, let's make some music. He wanted to put a band together and, you know, come up with some song ideas. And that was it. That was really, you know, obviously the good contacts, but my eyes were just opened about what possibilities there were. So it wasn't actually difficult to find a band. I was really interested in building a band that believed in what it was doing, was playing emotionally. It was about the music, it was about the emotion. And that's when it started to get serious because we realised we had put together some, uh, if I can use the term, quite killer songs. They were really good in terms of doing something different. We wanted to be absolutely real. That was the main thing. I mean, we did tend to wear a lot of, a lot of dark clothing, a lot of costume jewellery. We did wear makeup. We did have, you know, uh, work on our hair. I mean, I think one of the important things was it was showbiz at the end of the day. It's called showbiz for a reason. You know, you're putting on a show. So it wasn't a case of turning up in jeans and T-shirts and, and being real in that sense, but it was recognising that the audience has paid good money. They, they, they want to have a show. Um, but it was just so pleasurable that it wasn't like when I'd been working as a um, venture capitalist in London and each day you got up and you knew what you were going to do and you know, it was almost back to, back to the drudgery, no matter how interesting the work was. Uh, being a, a, a rock and roll musician in Hollywood at that, at that period of time, it was, it was like being on holiday every day, but tempered by the fact that it could come to an end at any point. So it gave you sort of an edge to make the most of things. And I remember our drummer, who was Canadian as well, like myself, he was an illegal alien. And, um, you know, he used to say, if I get deported, I don't want to go back to Canada. And people say, hey, well, how did you get on in LA? And say, uh, I slept a lot. Or I went to Disneyland quite a few times. You know, Time here is limited, it's borrowed. There's only one thing that matters and that's rock and roll. That's the music, that's the band. And we just channeled absolutely everything into that. It was, will it make the band better? If it was, do it. If it wouldn't, don't do it. You know, whatever it might be. And that could be social, it could be chemical, it could be financial, it could be anything. It was all about the band.
Yes, um, it's it's uh, the story of how we split up is quite an interesting one. But we were in the studio cutting an album, and our singer came in and the producer suggested that he sang one line in a slightly different way that he thought would give the song a slightly more commercial flavour. And I wasn't in the studio at the time and it's the one biggest regret I have in my whole life that I wasn't there that night because I think I could have changed things but anyway, maybe I couldn't, but anyway, the singer said to the producer when he suggested he sang the line differently, he goes, you don't understand man, when I'm singing, that's from my soul you don't tell me how to sing and he walked out and we basically never saw him again you know seven years like brothers we were like brothers and that was it somebody had tried to uh you know compromise his artistic integrity and he wouldn't have that and he left the band and we tried other singers and tried to put other things together but of course you know the chemistry wasn't there the magic wasn't there and for many years i've had such a hard time dealing with this that you know, he destroyed what we'd been building up and working for, and we were just on the absolute cusp, you know. Um, and it took me a long time, really, to realise that that is probably the most pure example of artistic integrity I've ever come across. When we did what we did, we were doing it because it was us. It wasn't because it was going to sell records or get more people to a venue or get your name in the music papers again. And that was all there was to it. That was the magic. And when somebody tried to interfere with that on a commercial basis, it, uh, it, it killed the band. But when I went to collect my uh, amplifiers and things at the end of uh, when the band broke up and the, the guy who worked in the studio just sort of took me aside and just shook his head and goes, I, I can't believe you guys, have, you guys have split up, man. He goes, um, yes, you were a band. And now this is a guy in Hollywood. Now people like Alice Cooper used to rehearse at the same studio. You know, for him to say that, He'd been seen it all, done it all, you know, every band had come through there just to give us that. That was probably one of the, the, the best accolades I think I had, and he was right. We, we were a band, you know, that, that was what we were. I'm going to get emotional now. <laughs> I left in 1994, and uh, I think I mentioned at one point I got married uh, whilst I was in um, Hollywood. I actually got married uh, twice, and my second wife had a, had a baby. Um, but when he was six months old, she decided she didn't really uh, want to be a mother. Uh, she wanted to go back to her actress modeling career um, aspirations. So I became a single dad and I very quickly realized I did not want to bring up my son in Hollywood, um, you know, in, in, in that sort of rock and roll lifestyle really. So I cut all my hair off and I came back to uh, the UK. My father was farming in Wales at the time. And so I came back, I worked on the farm, I lived in a caravan, and I brought up my, my son from, um, from six months old. My rock and roll days were over. It was time to concentrate on something that I could really pursue as a solo instrument. And the bagpipe is the ultimate solo instrument. I guarantee I could stand on any street corner, in full Highland dress, in any town in Britain and start playing and you, and you draw up a crowd. Nowhere to hide, just you, three drones and a chanter, you know, and, and the pipes. And I think everybody can, everybody can tell um, whether you mean it. And I think that's the single most important thing, whatever you're doing musically, whether it's rock and roll, whether it's jazz, whether it's blues, fusion, traditional Highland music, it's, it's got to be real. People, people will see through it in a second. And I absolutely adore the music. I, I'm never happier than when I'm, when I'm playing the pipes. And I've never been happier in my musical life than I am now as a piper. I think it's extremely important that one enjoys every aspect of one's life. If I didn't enjoy my job, I wouldn't do it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be about the money. And I think you also have to look for the joy pretty much in everything you do. Um, there's a famous Latin inscription I've seen on, on a backgammon board, and I can't remember what it is in Latin, but basically it means, as in life, so in a game of chance, a skillful player can make something of the worst of throws. Whatever life throws at you, and you know, I've encountered this situation, I think really sort of when I broke, when I lost, what I sort of loved more than anything really, when I was living in Los Angeles, the life that I had there, and I was living in a caravan as a single dad in, in Wales in a, in, a, in, a, in a wet winter. You just absolutely have to make the most of everything, whatever it is. But if it's not bringing you joy, if it's not making your life feel worthwhile, 
then you're doing the wrong thing. That's when you've got to find something else to do. Peaceful still across our land.